This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Library. It might surprise some of you to learn that one of our favorite places to spend time in the halcyon days of our youth, long, long ago, was the library. Bookstores were a close second, but the library took the top spot. Surprising, right? I mean, who would have expected that a pair of gaming nerds whose formative years happened in the era before the internet and who now produce a podcast that is nothing but word etymology and historical, cultural, and scientific factoids would have spent a lot of time around books as kids? And honestly, apart from our love of learning, the local library also helped out our early budding love of tabletop role-playing games. See, we got interested in role-playing games just as we crossed into our double-digit years. And being only 10 years old, we didn't have a lot of money to drop on gaming products. But boy, did we ever want to. We really wanted a subscription to Dragon and Dungeon magazines. And once we'd gone through all the material in our little Frank Mincer Red Box Basic Dungeons and Dragons set, we had our greedy little eyes on those fancy hardbacked Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition rule books. Fortunately, our library had them all. In the periodical section, we could pour over the latest issues of Dungeon and Dragon to our heart's content. And at a nickel a page, we could photocopy any article or adventure that we wanted to preserve in our grubby, weathered, abused gaming folder. And when we wanted to borrow the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition Dungeon Master's Guide to marvel at all the amazing artifacts, relics, and magical items, we could just mosey over to the non-fiction section, find the shelf numbered 790 to 795, grab it down, borrow it for free for three weeks, and then return it. We recently found ourselves thinking about the hours we spent at the good old library as we kicked off a new Forgotten Realms campaign and decided to start some of the action at the Candle Keep. Which you Forgotten Realms buffs will know is the most famous and most impressive library in all of Faerun. And all of you computer role-playing game enthusiasts of a certain age will also recognize it too. Because the Candlekeep is not just the center of learning in the Sword Coast in the tabletop game. It was the starting location for all of the action in the computer game that proved that Dungeons & Dragons could really prosper as a video game franchise. We're talking, of course, of Bioware's 1998 Baldur's Gate, published by Black Isle Studios. There had been some decent Dungeons & Dragons video and computer games before 1998, and even non-computer games, because the first true D&D licensed electronic game product was actually a handheld, standalone game released by Mattel in 1981. The player tried to maneuver a character through a maze-like dungeon on the tiny black-and-white LCD screen and ultimately to kill a dragon, which thus satisfied the obligation to feature both a dungeon and a dragon. Mattel's Dungeons & Dragons computer fantasy game isn't really remembered nowadays for some reason. But then, along came Strategic Simulations Incorporated, who published Pool of Radiance in 1988. It was based on the first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons rules and kicked off the well-remembered Gold Box series of computer role-playing games based on the D&D franchise. And they did pretty well, but they were still fairly esoteric. They weren't blockbusters. And then, along came BioWare Studios. BioWare was established in 1995 in Canada by a pair of doctors, some friends, a few brothers, and a cousin or two. Well, the two main founders, Ray Musica and Greg Zeschuk, were doctors. And that's how they raised the money to start the company and publish their first game. But the impetus for starting the company was a project they'd done in medical school where, as part of a computer science class, they'd programmed a medical simulation. They were also avid fans of tabletop role-playing games, like the giant robot combat game MechWarrior, which inspired their first game, Shattered Steel and of Dungeons & Dragons, which provided the license for their immensely popular second game set in the Sword Coast region of the Forgotten Realms, Baldur's Gate. 
which sold over 2 million copies on release and made it just as big a hit as Blizzard's own dungeon crawler, Diablo. It also provided the game engine for a number of popular future licensed RPGs like Planescape Torment, which may be one of the best computer role-playing games ever, and the Icewind Dale series. And their success also laid the groundwork for them to eventually develop games like the immensely popular Mass Effect and Dragon Age games, which is why you've heard of them even if you're not old enough to remember getting Dragon Magazine from the library and playing Baldur's Gate in Windows 98. But we digress. Libraries. The thing is, libraries aren't just places where you can go to borrow books you can't afford to buy. In fact, the idea of a lending library is pretty modern. Well, relatively modern. The first mention of lending libraries, libraries from which you could actually borrow stuff, came from the 1500s. But the idea didn't start to become popular until the mid-1700s. And in the United States, the idea really caught on in the 1850s with the passage of school district library acts in many states. See, the very oldest libraries weren't there to make books available for the masses for consumption. They actually served as records depositories, as archives. See, the word library comes from the Latin word librum, which means book. The word archives comes from the older Greek word for public records. Actually, the word really means the original place, the source. That's because it referred to the central government building in a settlement, the town hall. It also gives us the word archon, which was one of the titles of the magistrates of ancient Athens. Anyway, the very first library we know about didn't have any books in it at all. And that's because the Babylonians didn't do the whole book thing. They kept their records on clay tablets marked with ideographs called cuneiform. The first known library wasn't even its own building. It was a room in a temple in the Babylonian city of Nippur set aside to contain written records. That was sometime around the 3rd millennium BCE. Babylon wasn't, of course, the only ancient place to keep record stores. Many governments and ancient kings kept archives. One of the most impressive was the records collection of King Ashurbanipal of Assyria, whose archive included 25,000 tablets, many of which had been collected from various temple archives around the kingdom. But it was really the Greeks who came up with the idea of maintaining a collection of books for study and learning in the West. It started with private collectors who just liked owning books, like the playwright Euripides. He had quite the collection. But then in Athens, in the 4th century BCE, philosophy became all the rage. And the big philosophers and the heads of various schools of thought also started collecting books and keeping them nearby where they liked to teach. Plato had his library, Epicurus had his library, Zeno... well, Zeno didn't, because he founded Stoicism, and that was based on not owning anything at all. So keeping a library was not something that fit their worldview. But the biggest and best library of all was Aristotle's library, which he kept at his local gym. The gym of the wolf god. Yes, you heard us, gym, as in gymnasium. Whereas today you probably think of a gym as a thing down the street full of sweaty people lifting heavy metal things and putting them back down and grunting and high fives and broing and stuff, back in the ancient days a gym was kind of different. Like around the 6th century BCE, a gymnasium was just a shaded field near a temple where you could run around naked. Seriously, the word gymnasium comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means nude as the day you were born. See, the gym was a place to practice athletics and combat and to impress the gods. And eventually, they went from being open fields to open courtyards attached to temples. But what does this have to do with Aristotle's library? Well, the gym wasn't just a place to get buff. It was a place to improve yourself. Well, it was a place for young men to improve themselves, to learn essential skills, skills like warfare and fitness, sure, but also gradually gyms became places for general education as well. And in Athens, during the Hellenistic period, they therefore became places where the great thinkers of the day would go to find young boys with nimble minds to teach their philosophy to. And yes, we know how that sounds. Anyway, in Athens, there was this temple and gymnasium dedicated to Apollo called the Lycaeum, 
And that's because one of Apollo's titles was Apollo Lycius, Apollo the Wolf. See, Apollo was a complicated god with a lot of aspects. Sure, he was one of the sun gods, but he was also a god of divine justice and judgment and of oracles and prophecies and of purification. He was kind of an intermediary between the divine and the human, passing knowledge and judgment to humanity, bringing light, protecting civilization, and so on. And he was pretty popular in a lot of places, especially in Lycia, where they had a great temple devoted to him which was supposedly built by King Danaeus after he deposed King Gelinor as the result of a prophecy sent by Apollo. But there's a lot of wolfish imagery associated with Apollo too, and historians are not really sure where all of it comes from or why. For example, coins depicting Apollo on one side were marked with a wolf paw on the other, and there were stories likening Gelinor to a bull and Danaeus to a wolf. Some myths about Apollo's birth, along with his sister Artemis, have them being delivered by a wolf in Iceland, and Apollo sometimes sent wolves to help petitioners, and he was helped by wolves once in a while, like when he killed a giant snake monster called Python and a wolf brought him some laurels to wear to celebrate. The point is, the Lycaeum was a gymnasium and temple devoted to Apollo, and it's where Aristotle did a lot of his teaching, and also where he established his library. And the thing about Aristotle's library that was important was that it wasn't just meant to be a collection of books, it was meant to be a resource for research and study. And the library was in a room adjoining a cloister called the Peripatos, which is why the students of Aristotle at the Lycaeum were called the Peripatetics. Incidentally, if you spent your formative computer gaming years in the lands ruled by Lord British instead of in Faerun, you might recognize the Lycaeum as the great library and center of learning in the lands of Britannia though you probably pronounced it Lyceum. But remember, in ancient Greek, that C is always hard. Now, Aristotle's library was important and influential and worth mentioning for three reasons. First, it was the first major library to be established not just as an archive, but as a research library. It was meant to be used as part of scientific inquiry. Third, it actually established the foundation of one of the most famous libraries and library tragedies in all of history. But we'll get to that. Second, though, it was very well organized. See, for a library to be useful for research instead of just as a pile of records, you have to be able to find the stuff you're looking for and the stuff related to the stuff you're looking for. And so Aristotle developed a classification system to keep his library organized and to keep texts on like subjects near each other. And the problem of library organization was a big one throughout the history of libraries. Aristotle was pretty systematic, sure, but he still organized his collection using the exact same system as every other library of the day, which was however the heck he, the library owner, wanted. There wasn't really a general scheme for organizing libraries. And most libraries in the classical era were essentially private collections. And most libraries in the medieval era didn't exist as libraries. We'll get back to that. And during the Renaissance and the Reformation, libraries went back to being mostly private collections managed by individuals or private institutions. And so, each owner or manager would organize their books according to their own whims. It worked well enough, though. There just weren't that many books on that many subjects. And then in the 16th century, the printing revolution happened, which we've discussed before, and suddenly there were a lot more books on a lot more topics. At the same time, the attitude toward libraries was changing in the Western world. It was from the 16th to the 18th century that private book collectors started doing something new with their collections. They started donating them to government-run archives. And this is when we started to see the first national libraries. A national library is a library established by a government decree to act as a repository of information. The goal is not to lend books or even facilitate research. It's to preserve knowledge. Remember that, we'll come back to it. With the establishment of national libraries, whose purpose was to collect pretty much all the books, and with a sudden expansion in the number of books that existed, there was suddenly a real need to come up with a way to keep all the books organized, really well organized, and the first true published systematic classification scheme that anyone could use came from Jacques Charles Brunet. 
Born in Paris in 1780, Brunet was the son of a bookseller whose father was, as a bookseller, a member of the Paris Booksellers Association, basically a professional collective or guild. But Brunet himself wasn't a bookseller. He was a bibliographer. That title comes from the word biblios, meaning book, and graphi, meaning to record or write down. He was a cataloger, and he got his start cataloging book collections for auction houses. See, when a wealthy collector wanted to sell off or donate his book collection, someone had to go through and catalog all the books he had, right? That's why auction houses would hire a bibliographer. Brunet came up with a scheme for classifying books based on five major classes theology, law, science and art, history, and criticism and commentary. That last was called Belle Lettre in the language of the day, which was French because this was Paris and literally means nice writing. Anyway, Brunet's system worked so well that the Paris booksellers adopted it as their official classification system and decreed everyone should use it, at least everyone who sold books in Paris. Of course, different countries with their own national libraries have tackled the problem of library organization with their own schemes. And that brings us around to one of the most well-known American systems of library organization. The one that we referred to when we said we'd head over to the 790s in the nonfiction section to find our D&D books. And that was the system first published by Melville Louis Kosath Dewey in 1876. The system is called the Dewey Decimal Classification System, and most school children in America learned it in elementary school once upon a time. It's a system based on subject hierarchies. It starts with ten main subject groups for nonfiction books. General books, philosophy and psychology, religion, social science, language, science and math, technology, the arts, literature, and history and geography. Each group is given a range of 100 numbers. For example, history and geography books are numbered from 900 to 999. Each subject is further broken down into subcategories, so European history is in the 940s, and English history is in 942, and the classification gets more specific by adding decimal numbers. So English history during the reign of the Stuart family is number 942.06, and books about English history under the Stuarts during the English Commonwealth era are assigned the number 942.063. And that's how we always knew where to find our role-playing game books. They were in the 700s, the arts, and they were in the 790s, recreation, sports, and performing arts, and they were at 794, indoor games of skill, as opposed to 795, games of chance, because it was advanced Dungeons and Dragons. You had to know what you were doing. Now, if all of that sounds very complicated, well, it is. And that's because the system has been revised many times to manage the broad variety of nonfiction materials being published as literacy and publishing soared in the 21st century. When it was first published in 1876, the system was described in a four-page pamphlet. Now it's been revised 23 times, most recently in 2012, and includes 27,000 subcategories, sub-subcategories, and sub-sub-sub... You get the idea. And there is a movement to put the Dewey Decimal System out to pasture and replace it with the official Library of Congress classification system. That's the National Library of the United States. It uses its own system, which was designed in 1897 by the then Chief Librarian of the Library of Congress, Herbert Putnam. And it's pretty similar to the Dewey System in that it's based on categories and subcategories. But it uses letters instead of decimal numbers. And also the numbers. Whatever. So our beloved Dungeons & Dragons books would be found under call number GV1469.62. That's G for Geography, Anthropology, and Recreation. Then subcategory V for Recreation and Leisure. And then 1469 for Games and .62 for Fantasy Games. The thing is, Despite the move to retire the Dewey Decimal System, it's still quite popular. More local libraries in the United States prefer it over the Library of Congress system, and the Dewey System is actually used in over 200,000 libraries in 135 different countries. But it is slowly being phased out. Which we, frankly, consider a disaster. <laughs> 
because we know the Dewey Decimal System backwards and forwards. But speaking of disasters, we promised we'd talk about the most well-known and tragic library disaster in history, as well as what happened to libraries in the medieval era. So let's talk about the library at Alexandria. In a lot of ways, the library at Alexandria was the precursor to the national libraries of the modern era. It was planned by General Ptolemy Soter, Ptolemy I, who we recently mentioned in our episode about poison. He was the general who served under Alexander the Great and established the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt that Cleopatra was descended from. See, Ptolemy had an idea to archive all of the great written works of Greece and the classical world in one place, and he started with copies of everything Aristotle had enshrined at the Peripatetic School in the Lycaeum, and built from there. Actually, it was his son Ptolemy Philadelphus who did the work, along with an advisor named Demetrius of Phaleron. Anyway, they gathered up copies of every work of literature they could find for the library in the capital city of Ptolemaic Egypt, Alexandria. And, like all the best libraries before it, it was built in a temple. This one was called the Mousion, and it was devoted to the Greek patron gods of the arts, the Muses. Now, you should remember from our episode about poison that Ptolemaic Egypt became politically unstable. It got embroiled in Roman politics when Julius Caesar hid there from his political rivals and teamed up with Cleopatra to restore her to power and build an army that could return Caesar to Rome. And then the whole thing exploded because Cleopatra's brother, Ptolemy XIV, sided with the other team. Well, one day in 48 BCE, Caesar had this cunning plan to prevent Ptolemy's naval fleet from landing in Alexandria. He set fire to his own fleet of ships and the wharves basically making the harbor inaccessible. And it worked. It worked really well. It worked too well. The fire spread to the Library of Alexandria and destroyed it. Or did it? Remember all that stuff we said about Roman propaganda in that episode? How everyone was trying to sell a good story to win the hearts and minds of the people? Cleopatra, Caesar, Mark Anthony, the Roman patriarchs, everyone. Well, this whole story about Julius Caesar accidentally burning down the library at Alexandria may have been another piece of propaganda. There's strong evidence in the writing of the day that Caesar didn't destroy the library. At worst, his fire did some damage to a warehouse that had some scrolls in it by the docks. The library wasn't fully destroyed until more than two centuries later when the city, under the declining control of the Roman Empire, was invaded by the forces of Queen Zenobia who ruled a splinter state in Asia Minor that had broken away from Rome. And during the fight, the neighborhood where the library stood was destroyed pretty completely. And because Rome had already been in decline, and most of the libraries in the Roman era were small collections in the hands of private collectors, during the years of fighting that followed as Rome fell apart, most of these collections were lost or destroyed too. And except for archives kept in the hearts of monastic churches that preserved what they could, Libraries disappeared, for the most part, for a few centuries. Because unlike us as kids, the Romans preferred to spend their time at gym, instead of hanging out in the library. They probably didn't even know the Dewey Decimal System. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Mm-hmm.